Disarmament Coordinator for the American Friends Service Committee. Um, he focuses on preventing nuclear war and achieving nuclear weapons abolition, education, and organizing for peaceful and just alternatives um, to U.S.-led uh, militarization in Asia and the Pacific, and also the prevention of U.S. wars, focusing most recently on the Ukraine and Iraq. He has initiated and is currently co-coordinating uh, co U.S. and international NGO planning for the 2015 MP MPT review. Let's give a little plug. There's a, a flyer over there in the back um, with contact info. Um, and he's co-coordinating that with two of our other presenters, Jackie Cavasso here and Judith LeBlanc, who will be um, on the panel of the next workshop in this room that I encourage you all to attend. Um, he convenes the Working Group for Peace and Demilitarization of Asia, Asia and the Pacific is a board member of the International Peace Bureau and a steering committee member of the Middle Powers um, Initiative and the No to NATO, No to War Network. He has long been active in justice and peace movements, beginning with the civil rights and Vietnam era peace movements. He helped launch the nuclear weapons freeze campaign and was co-convener of the 2010 NPT Review International Planning Committee. His books include Empire in the and the Bomb, How the U.S. U uses nuclear weapons to dominate the world, and the sun never sets, confronting the network of U.S. foreign mil military bases. So welcome, Joseph. First of all, just to uh, say that it's you know, sort of an honor to be uh, following both uh, Jackie and Ramana, and in some ways my, my remarks will, will build on that. Thinking as we start, I was thinking of both of dreams and nightmares. Uh, listening to Ramana's speech, I was thinking of uh, Kurosawa's, one of his last movies, uh, Dreams. And you get to the last dream, which is this vision of an idyllic, non-consumer world. And I just would encourage people to, to track that down, to give yourself a sense of, of, of what's possible. Uh, on the subject of nightmares, I want to show you this uh, first uh, picture here. Um, I, I first saw it at a seminar at Harvard University. Uh, and what it has, as you can see, are Chinese and Japanese warships and Taiwanese uh, fishing vessels. Now, if you can tell which is which, you're doing better than me. Uh, and there have been a number of incidents, and in that session, uh, Ezra Vogel, who was in charge of uh, 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 intelligence uh, for Asia uh, at the State Department in the first Clinton administration, uh, said, you know, if, if we have an incident there, we can have no confidence, he said, uh, that escalation can be capped. What he means is that you begin with Japanese and Chinese military actions, uh, then with the United States, both Obama and Congress, having said that the U.S. Uh, alliance with Japan means that if there are, if there are military actions, military, military war, uh, the United States has to come in on Japan's side. Uh, then put yourself into what happens when the United States and China are at war and how that can be contained to a non-nuclear crisis. So this is the picture that has haunted me uh, for quite some time. And simply to say this is a not one-off event. And this is what it's like there uh, very, very frequently. And I want to encourage people who are thinking about human survival uh, to begin to think about what's happening there. Additionally, and I don't have the, the map on this one right now, uh, think in terms of the South China Sea, uh, which is much larger. Uh, where it has uh, under, under the seabed uh, not only classical minerals needed for manufacture, uh, but also uh, lots of oil uh, and natural gas. Uh, the Chinese have claimed at this point almost all of the South China Sea, uh, with, enough, with six other states of the ASEAN uh, countries also having claims to portions of it. The Chinese have said this is a vital interest, and Hillary Clinton said, well, in fact, it's a vital interest for the United States, too. And this is the area where you have a very, very sharp arms race and is yet another a very dangerous uh, tinderbox uh, for future conflicts. Uh, I guess I would also just underline uh, that uh, Susan Rice, formerly the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, now the National Security Advisor, uh, was just in China to prepare for Obama's forthcoming visit. Uh, and if you read the press, what, what uh, it says is the United States and Chinese relations are now at the lowest ebb in many years. This should concern us. Uh, the situation, actually, I'm going to focus on Asia Pacific, but I'll come back around to Ukraine uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but to say that, as I view it, the situation in Asia Pacific uh, has many, many analogies 
uh, to the situation in 1913-1914 in the run-up to the First World War. On the one hand, most fundamentally, you have rising and declining powers, the United States and China. Uh, remember, Obama made reference to Russia as a regional power, uh, not, not a major global power. Uh, you have arms races with new technologies. You're thinking in terms of the Pentagon budget. Much of it is focused on the process of trying to contain China militarily. Uh, you have resurgent nationalism. In China, nationalism is really the dominant ideology at this point, replaced uh, communism. Uh, in Japan, you have an extreme right-wing prime minister, uh, and Japanese nationalism is very powerful. Uh, one only needs to pick up a, a newspaper here in the United States uh, to think about how insane uh, our nationalism is as well. Territorial disputes. Uh, I've just pointed to a few. You have others as well. Uh, and I want to point to the, the, the role of those territorial disputes in relationship to resource wars. And when we're talking oil and gas, uh, we're talking in terms of fossil fuels, we're talking about uh, the CO, CO2, we're talking about climate change. So the very direct uh, relationship there. Uh, and you know, basically resource competition. Uh, Michael Clare, who will be speaking at the rally tomorrow, and he's speaking at, uh, elsewhere here, gave a really fine talk, uh, it was the last week, uh, at MIT. And he pointed out that on the one hand, uh, where as we have resource competition, competition for these climate change gases, we are increasing the dangers of war. And on the other hand, as we have uh, uh, increased military tensions, uh, we reduce the ability to move forward in climate change negotiations. Uh, you have to think in terms of the United States and China at this point making a fundamental deal. Uh, it's rather unlikely. And the third point uh, it was to stress the, 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 the reality that no one country can uh, really resolve or reverse climate change uh, that has to be a global effort. But then you have complex alliance structures. Uh, again, the U.S. Uh, Japan, the U.S. Japan alliance is fundamental, uh, but you know, Philippines is a major uh, uh, NATO partner at this point. Uh, we have alliance, we have military and military relations with, uh, Indo with uh, Indonesia. Uh, we now have military to military relations with Vietnam, with our uh, 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 ships now calling Cameron Bay. Uh, very delicate negotiations with India. The United States has to surround and isolate uh, China. I think in terms of what prevailed in, the, in, in 1914, as so those interlocking alliances went into function uh, following a gunshot in, in Sarajevo. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, you have economic competition and integration. Back in 1914, it was thought that a, a war in Europe was impossible because of deep in, in, integration, uh, British and, and German trade, uh, but it happened nonetheless. And finally, you have wild card actors. Both the United States and Russia engaged in uh, nuclear missile exercises. Uh, to appreciate, uh, Jackie made reference to Eric Schlosser's book in terms of the history of uh, miscalculations and accidents. And this is the kind of time when accidents can happen. Um, you, know, you go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis and you literally had uh, senior U.S. military officers uh, who were increasing the level of the nuclear alert in ways that the uh, Soviets could see and we could not. A very dangerous kind of situation. And there's a history of, of, of accidents there. Uh, we're going to have to deal with that. Uh, as we look at the Ukraine crisis, we should uh, understand that, uh, contrary to what we read in, in, in the dominant media here, uh, the United States and the European Union played fundamental roles in bringing that on. Uh, to remember that when the Berlin Wall fell, um, uh, the terms of, of agreement were that Germany could uh, reunite along West German terms in exchange for uh, the, uh, the pledge from the West that we would not expand NATO one centimeter closer to, uh, to Moscow. Uh, to remember that from a, a Russian perspective, uh, they're, as they look West, uh, they're thinking in terms of Napoleon's invasion, uh, Kaiser in World War One, Hitler in World War Two, cost of tens and tens of millions of, uh, of Russian people. Uh, and so while we don't praise what uh, Putin has done in response, uh, we need to understand uh, the, the fundamental fear that the Russians feel as NATO has expanded, you can see in, in, this, in this slide. Additionally, the European Union uh, bears considerable responsibility in the negotiations on trade. Uh, you had uh, the EU proposal, which was zero sum. Uh, 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 Ukraine had to uh, commit to full and open trade relations with the West while cutting those with Russia. 
uh, and this is extremely difficult, you can understand, in a country where major portions of the country had major trade relations uh, with the East, uh, which has uh, been long divided between those looking toward Russia, those looking to the West, and the religious divisions uh, between Russian Orthodox, those who follow Russian Orthodox faith uh, and those who uh, are, are Catholic and more Western oriented. Uh, so then turning here, um, I, I want to break some of the abstractions. You know, you, some of us think saying yesterday at a meeting, you know, that uh, we're approaching the 70th anniversary of the a bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We should celebrate that there hasn't been the use of nuclear weapons uh, for the last 70 years, uh, despite the fact that Eric Schlosser and many others who've studied the history of nuclear weapons accidents, miscalculations, uh, would say that it's, uh, our survival is less a function of wisdom and more a function of accidental luck. Uh, the reality is uh, that the United States has used, and other nuclear powers to a lesser extent, have used their nuclear weapons time and again uh, since 1945. Daniel Ellsberg, who was a senior advisor to uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, to Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and initially Nixon, uh, explained that the United States has used uh, those weapons uh, during uh, international crises and, uh, and wars in the same way that an armed robber uses a gun in the middle of a robbery. And he points the gun at your head, whether or not he pulls the trigger, the weapon has been used. Uh, as early as 19, we have the whole idea of deterrence, right? 1946, the Soviet Union did not have nuclear weapons. Uh, yet Truman threatened to eliminate Moscow uh, if the Russians did not withdraw from the portions of uh, northern Iran uh, that uh, it had occupied with U.S. agreement uh, during the Second World War, principally to supply Russia uh, with weapons. Uh, this is a history of the U.S. use in, uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, there's only a small portion of it. As you look here, uh, numerous threats against North Korea uh, beginning in 1950. Uh, helps to explain why North Korea uh, has become a nuclear power. Uh, five times against China, uh, beginning in the 1950s. Uh, four times uh, against Vietnam. Uh, it's a consistent pattern. Uh, then if you look to, um, to the Middle East, again, it begins in 1946. Uh, during every major Middle East war, uh, the United States has prepared and threatened to initiate uh, nuclear war weapons, a nuclear war. Have the, you know, the, 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 de the details and the history are in the book uh, Empire uh, and the Bomb. Uh, let me just point to a couple other things. I mean, we tend to think, well, with the end of the Cold War, uh, there goes the danger. But let me give you a, a post-Cold War history of their uh, use. Uh, 1996, uh, Clinton threatened their use against Libya, at a time when uh, Gaddafi was our enemy. Uh, 1998, uh, against Iraq. Uh, stepping back uh, again to 1996, there was an exchange of threats between the United States and China uh, over, over Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese sent a message that it's just coming before a major election in uh, Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese sent a message that uh, uh, the United States certainly valued Los Angeles more than did Taiwan. Uh, and then Clinton responded uh, by sending two uh, nuclear-capable uh, U.S. aircraft carriers through uh, the Taiwan Straits, absolutely terrorized the Chinese. They had no defense against it, uh, which in turn led to much of their, their subsequent buildup. Uh, you know, we've had now since the Bush administration all options on the table in relationship to Iran. When a nuclear power says all options on the table, that's what it means. Uh, you have know, threats against Korea. Uh, we had the India-Pakistan uh, cargo war, uh, during which India and Pakistan exchanged nuclear threats. And to appreciate, the recent studies tell us uh, that the exchange of simply 50 to 100 uh, strategic weapons would result in global cooling, uh, the resulting famine uh, calling, uh, leading to uh, 2 billion deaths. Uh, so there's a deep integration here. And finally, Chirac of France uh, made a nuclear threat against uh, 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 Iran. Um, there's a lot more to say. Here's, here's on the nuclear weapons accidents and history. Um, so just to move to conclude here. Um, Jackie made reference to, to the Hibakusha, the politi politically engaged Hibakusha in Japan, who have provided major leadership for the nuclear weapons abolition movement. The man on the left, Senji Yamaguchi, is holding up a picture of himself. He had 20 operations 
uh, one of the founders of the movement, uh, incredibly courageous and, and forceful human being. This is him talking at the special session on disarmament uh, at the United Nations in, um, in, in 1982. Uh, and uh, one of the basic messages of the Hibakusha is that human weapon, you know, human, human beings and nuclear weapons cannot exist. Uh, on your right is, a, uh, my right, is Joseph Rotblatt. Uh, he was the one senior scientist with the moral vision uh, to quit the Manhattan Project. Went on to found the Pugwash Conference. And I first met him in, in Hiroshima, uh, where, again, he said that uh, human, fa human species faces a very stark choice. We can either completely eliminate nuclear weapons, or we'll see their global proliferation and eventual use. Why? Because no nation will long tolerate what it perceives to be uh, an unjust uh, hierarchy of power, or in this case, terror. In this regard, I'd like to uh, celebrate uh, 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 Tony de Bruyne in the Marshall Islands, uh, where a, when you look at the hierarchy of power and threat, uh, the Marshall Islands has, has found a way to respond with amazing uh, moral courage and, and vision. Uh, uh, and just to conclude, uh, Sophia made reference to the Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, which will happen uh, next year. Um, it's been a frustrating process, but people should appreciate that terms and conditions of one of the most fundamental treaties of the 20th century uh, was that in exchange for the non-nuclear nations remaining non-nuclear, uh, the nuclear powers in Article 6 commit to good faith negotiations to completely eliminate their arsenals. Uh, and so a number of us are in the process. In 2010, we had a major conference and demonstration here in New York. The Japanese presented uh, uh, 7 billion petition signatures for abolition. Uh, Ban Ki-moon spoke at our conference. Uh, so we're in the process of, of organizing again and to appreciate that it has, uh, our, our work has three principles. Uh, one is to demand the complete elimination of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, second is to move the money to uh, cut military spending to meet essential human needs. Uh, and thirdly, to engage with the climate change movement. These are all deeply interrelated realities, and we need your support and help as we try to uh, make the change we need for human survival. Thank you. Thank you.